Ready? All right, here we go. Let's go. <laughs> this is Kathy Lang. It's May the 29th, 2003. I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio to interview Catherine Mueller. Catherine, tell us where you were born and when. I was born in Chillicothe, Ohio in 1921, March the 24th. So you grew up during the Depression? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. My father was out of work for quite a while, and he had 20 years to sleep on the railroad. He was a railroader, and he was out of work even after 20 years. It was bad. It was a bad time to be alive. Because you, I think. you got to go to school. You oh went. yes, yes, yes. We walked to school. We lived in the east end of Chillicothe, and we walked to St. Mary's in the west end of Chillicothe. We had a long walk every day to school, across the railroad tracks and everything. We could, that was always a good excuse when we were late. Train stopped us. <laughs> we always had an excuse. There was a long train, sister. <laughs> <laughs> and you ended up going to nursing school? Yeah, out of high school. At Good Samaritan Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. My sister went there before I did. My sister was three years older. And I have a picture of her. So you're going to be surprised. Can you see it? I think I, think I put it in here. It's the last picture we ever had taken together. She passed away in 98. This is when we took at a family reunion. See, there was a... So she's a sister. She was a nun. A sister of charity here in Cincinnati, Ohio. She was also a nurse. She graduated from Good Sam ahead of me. She was a good obstetrical nurse. She took special training for the obstetrics. So, so how did you like nursing school? Oh, I loved it. So you I were loved. a natural nurse. I don't know about that, but I just loved it. Everything about it. And when they took, just recently, not too many years ago, they took, tore down our dorm, our Victoria Hall over there. And that, oh, everybody my age and oh, you know, the older girls, just that really hurt us. That, that place meant so much to us. We were there three years. It was three years there to get an RN. And you worked hard, I bet, to get that RN. Oh, those nuns worked us to death. But you ended nurse. up being a good nurse, I bet. Oh, you they graduated training. good nurses, I tell you that. They get the credit. They had a good school of nursing and they graduated good nurses. And they had good reputation. They were all sisters that taught us. It was really a good school of nursing, the best here in Cincinnati, I know that. Now, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And everything changed for your generation. Yeah, and I can't stand to see a Japanese car on our streets. <laughs> and they did this the feeling that hangs on. I don't care what anybody says. But it's there. How did you feel when you heard the news? You know, I didn't. I was so young and naive. I didn't know what it was all about. I had I got to up on news of any kind, and we didn't. I didn't read the newspaper. We didn't have television in those days. We never turned on the radio except to listen to the hit parade on Saturday night or something like that. We were just too young. I wasn't paying attention. But I remember coming. I was working night duty, and I remember coming to our apartment. I was living in an apartment with three other girls. And there was a newspaper by our door when I got And I thought, well, for heaven's sake, someone who put the newspaper here, they had given it to us free, I guess, because we didn't know how to order a newspaper. And I said, I remember seeing the headline, whatever it was, I don't remember what it was, but it was the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And it meant nothing to me. It, I didn't have any idea what it was going to lead to. When did you realize that everything was going to change? Oh, it didn't take long. The whole country would. You knew it. There's things you couldn't get, things you couldn't buy. Everybody, the things that started to be rationed and stuff like that. 
you, you probably knew a lot of young men who were signing up to be soldiers or were being drafted. My boy, my girl, my boyfriend did. My husband, he did. When his time he was going to be drafted, he thought, so he went down and joined the Marines. But we'd been going together for about a year, dating, uh, off and on, and so. When he went down and joined, told me he'd gone down and joined the Marines, and the girl, my best friend that I was living with in the apartment, uh, was my best friend all the way through training. She went down and went without even telling me, and joined the Army Nurse Corps. And she came home and told me that. Well, when she left, that broke my heart. I didn't have anybody close to me except Reba. So then, when Cliff said he was leaving. I wasn't going to stay there by myself, so I would signed up too. And Dr. McFarland and I went in the same day. We said goodbye at Good Sam. He was our big obstetrician there. We both went into the Army the same day. Now, did you pick the Army for, because your friend did? Yeah, yeah. So you I, went and signed up to be a nurse. They probably really wanted you. Oh, yeah. They needed nurses. Yeah, they did. Well, I'll tell you how bad they wanted us. I was too young to take state board. I was only 20 when I graduated. And I was, you had to be 21 to take state board here in Ohio. And my birthday was the 24th of March. And Sister Deshama called me up and said, Catherine, will you be 21 before March the 30th? And I said, yes, I'll be 21 on March the 24th. And she said, then you can take state board with your class. So they pushed up the 21 age. And I was able to take state board with my class. Otherwise, I was going to have to wait six months. And you couldn't be a nurse in the service until you had your state board? That's right. Well, I didn't know I was in an RN. I had to be an RN. Then they gave us a, an officer's rank, first girl officer's rank, second lieutenant. We didn't go in as PFCs or anything. We were officers. But that didn't mean anything to us. So we were still civilians. It was a civilian army. And once you got in, did they train you? Yes. It was, let's see what did they do. I went straight from straight from Good Sam, from working there, straight to White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, to the Green Bar of all places. Wow. I don't know how long I was there, but it's on that card. I was there for two months. That's a beautiful place. Oh. Very yeah. luxurious. Yeah, and they said they had those nurses over in those cottages. There's, I don't know how many, six or seven nurses in the cottage. There were several rooms in some of them. There were about three bedrooms in ours. Oh, you walk in the plush carpeting and that dining room, we ate in that gorgeous dining room, and they played that orchestra, organ during the lunch hour and stuff, dinner hour. That was living high on the hog, and we thought it was it. I said, if this is the army, I never had it so good. It was a beautiful place. A big change for a child of the Depression uh -oh. to show up at the Greenbrier. Yeah, and then <laughs> said, them telling us that this was the army. <laughs> <laughs> but they were tearing it apart when we got there, taking down some of the beautiful chandeliers and taking up some of the beautiful carpeting and saving it. And, uh, because they were turning it into a hospital. And the train would come right to where I was there looking out the window the day the first patients came. And they got all of the train. And they were in wheelchairs, buddies were wheeling in wheelchairs, and some of them were walking with crutches and everything. When they got off the train, they walked toward the, well, the hospital. It was called Ashford General then. They walked, they got off of the train, and there come the wounded, walking, being wheeled. The litters, they come into the hospital and we were there the day the first ones came. But we'd been there for a while, we were setting it up, setting up the wards and getting them ready as hospital beds and stuff, instead of the luxurious hotel. So after, after your months in West Virginia, you got sent to Indiana, is that right? Oh, Seymour, Indiana. Yeah, it's an Air Force. That's when I, I was in, I was sent to the Air Force then. I guess actually I was in the Air Force when I got there. Did you choose to be in the Air Force? No, no, I didn't have any, any say so of it. 
They sent me there because they said, I asked, I tell why so I was enjoying swimming and everything, and I didn't know what I'd done wrong to get there. They said they wanted somebody that had psychiatric training in their hospital. Not all hospitals, school of nursing had good psychiatric wards. So they, I was one of them that was picked because of that. I guess, I don't know. But they sent me to Seymour, Indiana, which was a, where they teach pilots, young women, young women. The first stages of being a pilot, I guess. That's what it was. We were in a base hospital there. And you took and care of people? Just young boys. If they, got, if they got hurt or sick yeah, while they were in training, they, they weren't in, in the combat yet. Oh, no, no, no. Ulcers and things like that, and colds and sore throats and not much. You didn't have to go to sickness. Unless they got a uh, gonorrhea or something like that. Young boys do do that kind of stuff sometimes. So, when did you finally get sent out of the out of the states to England? Well, uh, uh, I signed up. For, I read in the Reader's Digest about air evacuation, and I told the head, the, the officer there I wanted to sign up for it. So he put my name on the list. And one day they called and told me I was going to Boyman Field for air evac. And what was air evac? That's where you fly in supplies on the airplane, and after you're in there, then drop, well, drop off supplies and pick up patients at different airstrips, all the way through, following the troops as they go along. We flew out a lot of patients, a lot of boys. Was it hard for you to see all those young men so t so injured and... Some of them were terrible. The worst one, some of them were terrible and some of them, most of them were just hurt and they behaved themselves and just really had them giving them something for pain, I think, prior to putting them on the plane. And on the short flights, it wasn't bad at all. We just from France into England, you know, and anywhere. We short flights. We didn't have long flights then. So you followed the troops. Did you ever, was there ever shelling going on, or did, peop did people try to shoot at your airplane? Not to my knowledge. They, I, they, they were pretty well protected when we picked up patients. I, I know the first time we went in on D-Day plus six, we had fighter pilot, we had some fighter planes around us protecting us, the hospital planes. I guess they were protecting them. So you were based in England? I was based in England, and the first one we first got there. Got a place called Greenham Commons. And uh, they had an airfield there. And it was, they had paratroopers and supply planes. Did you know what was coming, this big invasion? No, we, well, we knew it was coming. We knew someday it was going to come, and we did not know when it was going to come. And, but uh, I know that the story goes that Eisenhower was down at the camp the night before. And of course, I think it was the, where I was, was the first troops that landed over there because they were paratroopers and they flew. And uh, they assigned us a place to go on the base. We were, our quarters were pretty far away from where those planes were. They had to ride us over there. They had to ride us over there to go to Mass because it was, we had to get transportation. We couldn't walk that far. And so while we were there, they gave us bicycles. We rode we, we bicycles around. But it was a. Uh, I, so I never was shot at it, I know of. But you knew an invasion was coming. When they finally started to send the paratroopers over, I guess everybody figured we out. We didn't know it until we looked up in the sky and they sent us. I was at a. We had a hospital there at their base. And, uh, field hospital, you know, and we were, I was assigned to that in case any injuries came back on the planes. Of course, most of them bailed out, they parachuted out. They were, they didn't come back, they were busy over there. 
But when she came back, we didn't have any injuries. The radio pilots and the other planes. We were standing there, watched, looked up, and you couldn't see the sky. It was black with airplanes. You never saw such an armada. And you, you knew then that was the big Yeah, we knew then it was, we knew then it was on. That must have been scary for all those young men. Oh, it had to be. But after all the months and months and months of paratrooping and, and being dropped out of airplanes and going over, and then our boys got the hardest, the hardest beach to hit, you know. And I think we lost more than anybody because we had the hardest beach to hit. And the water got some of them. Of course, that's all been documented many times. So you you were waiting over in England, and then after six days, D-Day plus six, they yeah. started sending you over in planes. Yeah, we went over in good stations. By the time that time they had the airstrip built, that we could land over there on Normandy. Well, they worked fast, didn't they? Yeah. Six days. And the funny part is we land and pick up patients, and the boys on the ground, they were tired of eating K rations, I guess. And they'd say, you got any food? And so the next day, another nurse and I went over to the kitchen and said, they're asking us to give them some food, and we don't know what to give them. They gave us a big loaf of bread and peanut butter and jelly. And I had a big bag full of it, and she took a big bag full of it. So that when they came at the bottom of the plane, when we landed, they to unload and ask if there was any nurse aboard. I said, yeah, you want something to eat? And I gave them that bag of peanut and then every day that we went over there, they wanted to know if there was a nurse aboard. It's got the peanut butter and jelly. It was a treat to them then. Different, different than the K rations. <laughs> sure. So you were popular then. Yeah. Delivering a peanut butter and jelly. Is there a nurse on that one? <laughs> <laughs> and so you they would, don't remember that. Do, I remember it. Do they, did they set up like a triage on the beach for first aid to the soldiers? Was there medics with them when they went on? on oh, I'm sure there's medics with them all the time. So that when they got, were there. they got hurt, somebody gave them first aid, and then yeah. as soon as you could get in there with a the plane, yeah, you guys picked them up and took them back to England? If they were able to, if they were able to fly, if the doctor they were stable enough. If they were stable enough, then we would fly them back to England to base hospitals there where it was better equipped and everything rather than a field hospital. Did you learn a lot, Catherine, as a nurse in war? Oh, yeah. You had so oh, many I, horrible I injuries. Up. I was just, I was awfully young for my age anyway. I was never out in the world, but my home life was very strict and I was born Catholic and we went to Catholic school and I had all that Catholic training, and I never was out in the world. I was so naive, and it struck me as really devastating. And the thing that I remember most, when the boys would get into France, and we'd go in and pick them up, and we'd get them in, and they'd say something to them, they'd say, hey, she speaks English. They were so glad to see somebody that spoke English, and then they'd show me their babies and their wives, and. And that's what we were meant most for, for them, they could talk about, talk to you because you were American. And that's what they wanted to see Americans after they'd been in France for a while. And they wanted to talk about home and they oh. probably really missed their families. Oh yeah, and they showed right away to show you their little children that they had and they were taking their pictures of their wives. And if you could talk English, you had a lot to listen to. It was a lot of nice stories. Were you able to help a lot of them? Well, not really. We were, and I didn't have them that long. I, I was, they were complaining of pain and something like that. I'd give them a, a shot if they needed it. I changed dressings a little colostomies to keep the dressings dry. But we didn't have a whole lot of time with them. We were like a couple of hours and we were on the floor on the, in England again, and they were gone. Didn't get to know any of them. And then you went right back over to France and got some yeah, more? Yeah, got some more. So how many flights did you have to take in a day? Uh, usually it was one or two. One or two a day? Yeah. 
And you got to remember the English weather. The weather in England, they have us grounded sometimes for several days too, because of fog. And when they talk about London fog, they know what they're talking about. It really is a bad weather. You had missed a lot of days on the kind of weather. Did you ever worry that they might get defeated over there? Oh, never, never, never. That never ended our minds. You were sure they were going to win? Except the bad, the worst time was the vault. Everybody will tell you that. The battle of the vault was devastating. And you were afraid then of those, for those poor men that were out there? Oh, God, there were so many of them hurt. And that well, was the only time I was ever frightened is when we got in the crane was headed for the boat and the pilot said, well, we got a landing strip to land where we're supposed to land. He said, but they don't know whether it's in American hands or German hands. We'll find out when we get there. And I thought, oh God, I hope it's American. We made it, it was American, but oh, what bad injuries these boys had. And I had a tracheotomy and clear up on the top shelf they got him and I couldn't see him good. I had no way of suctioning him. I did it was a, just a, I prayed all the way and I, I don't know when him was alive when I landed. They were all so sedated. I mean so much oh, I gave one of them a shot, I know. And then I went back to see another one and he just had no face from here down. His face was gone. They were just, these are young people. I mean, a lot of them lived that way the rest of their lives, but at least they were alive. They were probably really glad to see you. Uh, really glad to get back to England, don't you think? Oh, I imagine. Uh, they were looking forward to it. Getting out of the hellhole, out of the vault, and the cold, and snow, and everything. That winter was horrible, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it was awful. For you, too? Hmm? Was it horrible for you too? It was so cold, and of course when we landed, we landed, we had to wait so long before the before the uh, ambulance got there with the patients that almost froze to death and blackout, and you couldn't turn in much heat, and it just almost froze to death. I guess you must have really felt for the the people trying to care for the wounded out on the battlefield. When it was so cold oh. and they had such little supplies. Oh, they didn't have supplies, that was the thing. In the movie I saw recently, what was it, D-Day, something like that, the guy says, boy, we need those C-47s. We want to see some C-47s. Well, of course, that's what we were in, mostly, C-47s. Then we, could, and we had their supplies. And everybody was trying to get over there so bad with their supplies. And you couldn't get through because it was, it was the weather. The weather, and then you didn't know where the Germans were. Yeah, it was the weather. Was, that was one of the worst that uh, I remember anymore. And those poor boys out there, lots of them didn't make it. It was bad. Did you ever? Did you ever have any German? Um, patients? No. Always. I, my, I went to visit Reba, my girlfriend, you know, that I lived with and everything went through training with. I went to visit Reba over there. She was at a base at some hospital and I got a ride down so I could see her and she was taking care of Germans. And I never, I teased her all her life. And I was like, yeah, I went to see you. I was living in a hotel. No, oh, that's a real nice hotel. They took real good care of flight nurses, I'll tell you that. And she was in this, and I had an Air Force jacket, and the other nurses that were there were talking about me because I, what did I do to get deserve an Air Force jacket, you know? <laughs> a little bit of jealousy there. I had to laugh, and I always teased her about taking care of the Germans when I saw her. But she got, they were transferred and moved on to something else. The her patients were German. Where was she? Did she Somewhere in England. I had no idea where she was. I got a ride to there from somebody. So you had leave and you went to visit your yeah, friend? Yeah, I got an overnight or something like that. Somebody was going up that way. 
That's how it happened. Because the flies or something, somebody was driving up that way, and I said, oh, that's where my friend is. And he said, you can come along. And I got permission to go and ride up and stay. I spent, stayed all night with her and come back the next day. I don't know, it was two or three hour drive, I guess. How did you like living in England? You know, I wasn't there to really know. I know that it's cold and it's damp and it's foggy. And that we had winter uniforms all the time we were there. And one time in Scotland we were walking along the beach and the people were in swimming. We had winter uniforms on and they were in swimming. So that's the, <laughs> that's the difference in how we tolerate the, could tolerate the cold. We were always cold. Did you work with the British people, other nurses and soldiers, no, the British? I never, never had much of So you didn't interface with them no. at all? How did you feel about the pilots and the rest of your crew? Well, now I knew that they were the neighborhood kids, and, they, <laughs> and I hoped that we didn't have to go too far. <laughs> you know, with them, no, they were all pretty good. I, I couldn't really tell you the name, I never met them when we got on the plane, they were up front. And, I really never talked to any of them, unless I needed something. Unless a patient was acting up and I needed help. How many nurses would be on one plane? Me. Just you? One. By yourself? Yeah. And how many patients would you pick up? I'm trying to remember. One, two, three, four. Let me see. There's a picture of it in here. How they, they put them in the plane and how we had them in. And I know how many is in there, but I can't remember how many there really was. There's pictures of how you strapped that, put them on the straps, you know. And we strapped them into the plane. Oh, yeah. Looks like at least eight. Oh, eight. The last one was eight. You see, there's four levels of yeah. bunks, and then were they, did they go all the way back? Yeah, all the way back to the door. So one nurse had to take care of all those patients. Yeah, well, remember, it was a short hop from France to England. Now, when I was on the Atlantic run, that means Northern Atlantic, we were take drive, take, taking patients from Presswick, Scotland, to the United States, or, or to Newfoundland. We, they took us off at Newfoundland, and another nurse would go on, because it was about 10 hours to Newfoundland. And those were in the bigger airplanes, and the pilots of those planes were regular TWA pilots. And they would be taking flying supplies from the United States over, and they would bring back patients. And of course we had a bigger plane, four engines, more patients, and a John, which we didn't have on the little ones. This was a big problem. In those C-47s, there was no place to go. How long did it take to go from France to England? Well, I guess it was about an hour. It wasn't long. Two hours, something like that. I can't remember the times. So you also did Scotland and Newfoundland? Oh, from Scotland to, yeah, in the C-47, the bigger planes. Then I flew into the United States six times. I saw Cliff six times. From England to the United States. Uh -huh. So you have a lot of time in the... In the long hours then, and the hours was now in super jets. It's such a short time, but in those days it was well over 12 hours. 12 hours. Yeah, because we did stop in Newfoundland and Iceland sometimes. I this one time I stopped in Greenland. That was it. Then we stopped in. Let's see. The only one time we had to go to the warm route, southern route, and because of weather, I guess. And we stopped at Bermuda, and oh my, how I would have liked to have gone back to Bermuda someday. I never made it. I said, of all the places I'd like to go back to is Bermuda. 
because from the air it was absolutely gorgeous. And we, I looked down on the, from the airplane, and I didn't get off of the airplane, they wanted me to, and I had too many patients. They sent a box lunches from lunches for them, you know. But I looked down, and we were, here we are, all these cold, always cold in the winter uniforms, and they were all tan in summer uniforms <laughs> on that beautiful island. And I thought, oh, how beautiful it is. I'd like to come back here someday. I never made it, but I won't be needed until I saw it from the air. And it was gorgeous. You got married in 1943? It's set at the base in Seymour, Indiana. So your husband was a Marine? Uh-huh. And he got, you both got leave? And yeah. you came to Seymour, Indiana and you got married? Right, yeah. Yeah. But we had been go dating, you know, for a year, but one time when I, I got a leave, went up this weekend or something, we went to train, you know, we rode the, I rode the train up to Chicago, he was in Chicago. And uh, going to school, they sent him to an electrician school. And uh, he was just making too good a grade, they kept him there. He never did go overseas. Well, that's good, he was lucky. He was real good, yeah, he was lucky. And, uh, so he was studying to be an electrician? Yeah. He, he, uh, airplanes, flying airplanes, the wiring of the airplanes. And he was getting good grades and everything, so he, he was So you were the one who really saw the action. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You were there from D-Day all the way through the bulge. Mm -hmm. Those were the hardest battles. Yeah. Where were yeah. you when, on Victory Day? Victory Day, the, I was... The E-Day. The E-Day, I was back in the States. I was home. I, I, I don't know whether I was still in... When was it? I don't know whether I was still in the service or not. Yeah, you were still in. It was in May of 45. And I got out in November, November of 45. I'm trying to think, May. I don't know. Do you remember just being really glad that it was over? What? Were you just really glad that it was over? Oh, uh, yeah. That was, uh, when the, that was a, uh, I think the Japs were the worst to defeat. That was really worse. But I don't know, it's all real bad. You didn't have to go to... One thing that we were scared of in England were these buzz bombs they sent over. It says it's the beginning of the rocket area, the Germans. And <laughs> We, we could hear them from our dormitory, a building we were in. It used to be a, a Greenham Commons was a spa of some kind. They had mineral waters, tubs where they could, could go to. And we were in one of the little barracks, like the housing. And about all of us, we were 25 in each group of nurses. And we were all in cots in there, one the big rooms, you know, in there. And that's how we lived. When we were there, the time I got off, I tried to. And learn you would hear them. those buzz bombs. Oh yeah, the night we'd hear them, I said, "Listen, you hear it?" And they were headed for London, but those were those first rockets, I guess. And they, were, they never knew where they were going to land, and they were really bad bombs. We, we would, they never came close to us. I don't think, but they, we could hear them going over at night. Didn't have a whole lot of them. I don't think the Germans had a whole lot of them ready to go. But they were called buzz bombs. <laughs> it must do something to your head to hear that all the time and always be wondering yeah. if it's going to hit. Well, uh, what if they're coming to us? I don't know. I never thought about that too much. I was too young because I was. I didn't know I wasn't going to die then. I can't die yet, and I'm going to die. I'm not sure I'd be croaked by now. <laughs> I'm not. I got my funeral paid for. <laughs> We've got the bath casket fit down. I got my my words for my hymns at the mass and everything. I, oh, and I paid the army. They're going to come and play my taps. All that's ready to go, <laughs> and I'm still sitting here. Well, I'm glad you are. <laughs> It's good for me. So, you made one or two flights a day. Yeah. For all those months. Uh -huh. 
And then once the, the soldiers got back to England, they went to the hospital and you didn't take care yeah, of them at that point. Yeah. Did you think your training at Good Sam, Sam Hospital helped you for your job? You know, not particularly. We didn't have any particular training, first aid or anything like that. Uh, we just had a general, every all around good teaching at Good Sam. We were prepared for about everything. But, but you were more like a paramedic. Yeah. You had to do like emergency. It was a, because it, it, we hadn't, we, did, we didn't have anything in our airplane to help us, medically speaking, or supplies of anything, but a little pocket, a little, well, it's not bigger than that, but a little medical kit. And in that we had sulfonyl and ice, some aspirin, and morphine, and uh, I'm trying to remember minor drugs that we could give the boys. But that's the medicine that we had and a few dressings that we had. We didn't have we didn't have a whole lot. Except on the big or on the longer flights and the bigger planes we had a chest in the back with a lot more dressings and everything in it. Did you ever feel like you couldn't really help them very much because you just there was nothing you could really do. There was nothing we could do on the planes, no, except watch them and observe them and give them something for pain and watch them for bleeding and talk to write, them. Write it down if we noticed anything. They all had a tag on them and talk. Talk them out of you and out the door on you. The gun one kid was going to go out of there right now. He didn't know where he was. He wanted to jump That's out. That's when I went up and said to the co-pilot, yeah, I might need some help to hold this guy down. But uh, he was all right. I talked to him. I talked to him all the way over the English Channel. Kept him quieted down. Did you, you have... can't let anybody jump out of an airplane on you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have that happen a lot? No. Just it once? Too often. The soldiers were pretty good. Um, As I say, patients. I think that they were well sedated before they left the hospital. The doctors prepared them well to, for the flight because they were going to be juggled around on litters and it's going to hurt them to be carried and it's going to hurt them to be hooked up on the straps and juggled and stick out an injury, you know. So I think the doctors would usually sedate them pretty good or give them pain medication before they left the, the emergency room place where they were. Do you think that it was an important job that you had? I think it was the beginning of, we were the pioneers, the first air evacuation there was. They didn't know how to train us and they tried to show us how to ditch in water, you know, with patients. That's, there's no way you could do it. No way you could get patients out of an airplane. They gave us a, a major disc for a parachute. We never wore a parachute. There's no way we could have let parachuted out. We would never leave the patients. That would be ridiculous. But uh, so you were the pioneers. Now they really were. There were no. There was never any. They didn't know how to. First of all, what to do with us when we got down to Bowman Field to train us. And they marched us, and we marched, and we marched. The marches wasn't training us, so we didn't know. And then, then we went out on the bivouac, and I don't know, oh, well, we had to crawl down on our bellies to shoot wire and stuff, like if we were in the fire. Well, that would be all right. We, had to, we could use some training like that in case we ever did come under fire. But we were too well protected. The nurses were. They didn't send us up to any front line or any place where we were going to get killed. The only thing that can happen to us mostly was a bad airplane and a bad pilot or something and we'd crash. Did you ever have any of the planes crash? No, oh yeah. Well, I think right before I took off in, in Scotland one time, it was before me, this girl took off, uh, Catherine somebody. And her name is in the book there. And the plane went down in the North Atlantic, the whole plane. And the, my poor mother, she knew what I was doing flying the Atlantic because I'd call her when I get into the States. And then they, when the, her friends knew I got married and they didn't know my married name, you know. 
and my lives with the come over the news flight nurse down in North Atlanta, Catherine, so and so. And when I was at mom's phone, she said, well, off the line. Well, what was Catherine's married name? Because everyone was, was afraid it was you. Yes. Her friends thought women didn't know what her married name was. And then it was me. But it wasn't. The only one that I know of. But there were more. That one I'm most familiar with. There were more that were down. So you guys were the pioneers. Now Airy Back is. Well, I saw one come. They come. They come from. They don't. They come from the over in Europe. There's one a week, I think. They bring patients up to North. I know one of our nurses came over on Airy Back unit that comes over once a week. And then people go to the hospital in Washington D.C. Walter Reed, I guess. But she had an injury to her back. But she's passed away now. But she came once a year to go to Walter Reed on an area back unit out of Europe. But you, when you, I saw one man during the last show that they were saying wounded returning, they were all returning by plane. They were, you saw them coming back by plane, the wounded from over in the desert and everything. They were flowing home. We'd come home on a boat. There's a lot of them. These guys, and there were two doctors and a <laughs> corpsman and everything else. We had a corpsman assigned to us, and I never saw him. They just never got there. They were out in the field, in the field working. So we were usually around. I never had many, any help. And you weren't afraid. Never, never. Then one time they called me up on. The granny friend said, I'm going to show you something when the engines was out. And I said, well, you got three more engines and we'll make it. <laughs> they were going to scare me. Another time, the pilot and the co-pilot and the navigator and whatever. And the other, I mean, there were four of them in the crew. And there was a bathroom. And then there was the gasoline tank in the bathroom. And then the pilot and the co-pilot and all that. And right here was it. And they put it on. It said the pilot said, Go back and tell the nurse I wanna see her and I walked up and nobody was there. They were all crowded into that John trying to scare me. <laughs> <laughs> they did that. And I, the one they were standing up on it and they tell us I was to get four guys in there. It was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> but they did that just to try to scare me. But uh, one, one time there was an engine out. But we still had to it didn't scare me. I was too young to get scared. So you just felt you no, were too I, young to die and you weren't going right. to worry. I wasn't going to die. I never once thought I was going to die. How did you feel about all those soldiers that were over there fighting for America? Oh, not just there. Here in the United States, this whole country. I don't think that... I think they were behind them in the desert there recently to some extent. But I don't remember anybody on the street telling us to get out of there, get out. And they came and, the Jeffs came and started it. And that's uh, how the country felt. We're not going to take that. And I don't think we should take the towers that they just recently did. They know nobody has a right to come into our country and do that to us. We don't, you got to, I don't know what the answer is to, but you can't change people's hearts either. So I don't know. That's for the next generation to worry about. Yeah. The electronic generation. <laughs> yeah, you guys did your job, right? So you, when you got out of the war, did you become a nurse? Were you a nurse as a job? Not, not till uh, I started having my family. And when my third child, Michael, was uh, in kindergarten, I started going back to part-time work at the hospital. And then uh, over the years, part-time, two nights a week became three nights a week. And they'd call me in for extra nights, you know, after school started. And I graduated. I gradually went up to working a lot more.
Did you like being a nurse? Oh, I loved it. I wish I could do it today. Nursing is nursing. It's, it's such a wonderful profession, I think. How do you think people felt about women serving in the military during the World War I couldn't have been treated nicer in my whole life as I was in the military. They treated nurses beautifully. I never, I never was yelled at or just everybody just treated us nice. The officers and the enlisted men, they disrespected us. You were all in it together. Mm -hmm. It was a big job. Everybody was, had a job. I think they, they just liked the nurses. I think they liked what the nurses stood for. Right. They really did, I think. I, I was treated nice all the time I was in the service, and especially in the Air Force part of it. And you got all your medals, your Air Medal, and your Service Medals, and your Bronze Battle Stars. I got one, one medal, but well, air medal, I guess. I got one medal. I don't know what that. I didn't know what all that stuff was in the box. They gave. They handed that to me. You know, they put me on a plane to leave from over there. They just said here, here. They didn't tell me what it was or anything. It was a medal. And I said, what's this? You know. And somebody said, well, there were five of us there being sent home because we were married. They sent the married girls home first, and uh, we didn't know what it was all about, so the doctor just handed us a medal, and that's how I got my air medal. It's in my bag for my funeral. I don't know who I'm going to give it to, but I'm going to give it to one of the kids. Well, you my must son, be, probably. You were probably proud of that, weren't you? It was oh, a lot yeah. of hard work. I didn't know what it was about. I know now. But they just hand it to me like a, it's nothing. I think sometimes they have ceremonies when people get a medal. Probably when there's a big mm -hmm. war, they just had so many. Yeah. How was it like here in the States during the war for your mom and uh, other people? I mean, they, they had rationing, they had yes, to. It was hard on them. It really was hard. Everybody had to do their part. Yeah. You know, you couldn't get cigarettes. My mother smoked, and she'd be bumming cigarettes, and good friends would get a pack here and a pack there, you know, give her one or two. Well, overseas, we got a carton of cigarettes a month, I think, or something like that, and I've smoked very little then. And not, not too many of the girls smoked, but I said, save me your cigarettes, I'm going to send them to my mother. So we got cartons. And I got a box and I put these cartons of cigarettes in and I sent them home to my mother. And you would have thought I sent her the world. <laughs> she said she never had so many friends in her life. And she'd come around and get to bum a cigarette. <laughs> they were hard to get in the States. Gasoline, tires for their car. So I got sick once when I was in New York with Cliff. And I had such a high fever, and we were in the hotel room, and I said, I woke up, the, I, the only thing I had, I had a terrible throat, and the only thing I had to take was sulfur, but sulfur doesn't do it. That was before penicillin, that's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> it was before you ever heard of penicillin, which would have cured me in a minute. And I ended up with, at 3 o'clock, I said, well, Cliff, wake me at at three and I'll take another one of those pills. Well, I, my throat was so bad I couldn't swallow. So I said, we better go, the arms must be swollen up or something. And we called the Red Cross and they took me to the hospital. And I was in the hospital a week. Then mm -hmm. I got to see Cliff the next weekend. That was the good part, huh? That was the good part. He got a weekend pass and came in and saw me again. Oh, he was a handsome soldier. Oh, he was a doll. He died in 1978, 63 years old. We didn't have our golden years together. But he was wonderful to me. We had two daughters and a son.
He was a handsome Marine. He was. He was and you looked handsome. beautiful in your uniform. And how did you feel about outranking your husband? Oh, that was a riot. <laughs> I just didn't. One time I teased him. I, we were talking to some friends. I said, oh, talking to some friends. And I said, sorry, he had to salute me. <laughs> and I said, oh, I don't think he liked that. I never teased him again. I was just teasing. But I never did it the second time. Because I could tell he didn't like that. So you were a first lieutenant when you... When I was discharged. That's pretty impressive rank. Yeah, I guess it is. I wasn't impressed. <laughs> I was ready to go home, start my family. I was 26 then, when I had my first baby. I was married at 22, but I, then I didn't get any children until I was out of the service. It must have been hard for you to be overseas and your husband's far away and oh, all was. this is going on and you wonder how long this war is ever. Yeah, of course everybody was in the same boat. And you just, I can't explain it. You just accepted it and accepted it so you didn't gripe about it or anything. You just accepted it because you were just one of millions and millions and millions. You were you to, everybody was the same way. And you knew you had to work together to do a really important oh, thing. Yeah. I can't tell you their love and, and patriotism that you saw during World War II will never be recaptured, I don't think. That we had, or that we still have. It's in us. Do you? How do you feel about people saying, "You, yours was the greatest generation of Americans"? I think they're right so far, but we got this technic, this uh, electronic generation coming up, <laughs> and they got these telephones in their ear. I think <laughs> they, they, they can't get away from you. You can't, nobody can get away from you if you don't want them to. If you know their cell number, boy, you, you got it. <laughs> it's hard for them to imagine that you guys would write letters to each uh, other. You might not get a letter for, what, weeks? Did you get letters all the time, or did sometimes it take weeks for you? It, you know, it, it was a long time sometimes. Sometimes yeah, some of it didn't. Like my aunt sent me something in the cosmetic line, and I never got it. It was in the bottom of the Atlantic, I guess. <laughs> when it was, there were a lot of ships sunk and things like that. So a lot of things you didn't get. There's a lot of missed things that family sent to them that we never got. But it wasn't because they were stolen. It was because they were lost in the, in the way the, you know. Today you would say, now somebody stole it. You wouldn't say that at that time. Nobody was stealing. Did you make friends in, amongst those nurses? Did you guys become a tight group? No, well, we were friends, but I never formed a tight group with any of them. I don't believe in cliques. I had one that I thought was a special friend. Mildred Shaner was one that I liked very, very well. But after Reba took off and went in the Army without telling me, I thought, now I'm never going to get to, that close to a friend again. So I just decided these people, these people I'm just going to see for a short time. So don't get too involved. You have such a good friend that you're going to cry when she leaves. And my Reba died last October. I saw her about well, a year ago. She came down to see me. She came down to see her grandson graduate from UC. And she came over to see me. And I was in a, in a chair with a busted hip and arm and stuff, all busted up. <laughs> I'm a bone breaker with falls. So anyway. But you got to see her. I got to that see her. That was nice. And she came back for our 50th jubilee at my, at the hospital. That's the last one I went to, our 50th. And there's one girl from a class at the hospital I talk to occasionally. We keep in touch. Her name is Rosalie McCon Walters. She's a 
very nice girl. She worked for the city at some one time. Have a night trouble. That's all. Do you think that your the years you spent in the service was a good thing for you? Yes. Yeah. It didn't hurt me. It never hurts anybody. I think the day that they had the high school boys to go in for a couple of years and you know, draft them for two years. Let them give a couple of years to the country. They'd be the bad. They wouldn't be so many of them on drugs and hanging around corners and not going to school. They'd get some discipline and they'd get patriotism and love of country and stuff like that. I know Kathy was saying she was teaching World War II at school. And I said, I don't think those kids know that there was a World War II. In some places, I know. I don't think they really understand the depth of it. I mean, yeah. wars today, they watch on TV and they last for three weeks. Yeah. They don't really understand how big this was and how long it went and how many people's lives were affected. I'd take them to Arlington and see the crosses. I'd take them to Normandy and see the crosses. It's terrible. The lives were lost. In Vietnam, I think it comes to 50 or 60,000 lives lost, and that's way too many. But in World War II, there were 250 or more of our, of my generation, killed. So there was a shortage of men in this country for a while after the war. Mm -hmm. A lot of girls were left standing without boys, but my generation there was. Well, you were lucky you got that nice looking Marine. Before he got away, <laughs> I tell you that's true. That's true. And he never once asked me to marry him. I went up to see him in Chicago and he just had put, put the ring on my finger. He never said, you're going to marry me. He just knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and he did get married to my father, Danny McGuire. They flew in the Air Force Base, did a nice mass, and our families came. I did it upright, though I was taught to do it by the nuns. Well, I just want to tell you that I thank you for your service to our country. Hello. And thank you for talking to us today so that people can remember. Well, what, what I hope I didn't do anything you. wrong. Or say anything wrong or something. Is there anything else you want to say? Any more stories? Hmm? Any more stories you want to tell or anything else you want no. to say? Sure. No. I was just treated nice. It's my sister. I want to show her a picture if you can. My sister. She died in. Was she a nurse in World War II? She was a, no, she was a nurse. But she was at a hospital out west. She was a teacher. Taught obstetrics. She probably prayed for you a lot when you were a Oh, God, yeah. And then when I had my first little girl, her name was Mary Eileen. My sister's name. And I told her if it was a little girl, she would have went by the name Sister Morris in the convent. And, uh, I told her if I had a little girl, I'd name her after her. So nothing got to her. I went out in the place praying, praying for a girl. <laughs> and then I had a little girl, I called her up. To, the sister on the floor called her and told her that uh, I could talk to her. And I said, hey, I had a Mary Eileen this morning. And she started crying and she couldn't talk to anybody. Aww. She was so happy. That's nice. So we were out of Mary Eileen. And this is Morris. Sister Morris passed away. I have a Kathleen. I have a Michael. And their last names are Muller, which is German. <laughs> but their first names are Irish, which is me. <laughs> and what was your maiden name? Cahill. K-A-H? C-A-H-I-L-L. -L. That's it. You were yeah. an Irish girl. Yeah, Katie Cahill. Yeah.
Was your, were your parents born in America? Yes. Uh -huh. But they come from, uh, their forefathers came from Ireland, probably during the potato famine or some time or other. I think I had an aunt that was looking at another aunt and a cousin that was looking up the Cahills in Ireland. The Cliff and I took Aunt Israel and Aunt Mildy to Ireland once on a trip to be his from the company. And, uh, oh, they just loved it. We just had the best time with them. Cliff said it was the best trip he went on, it was the Ireland trip. Was Cliff's family German? Yeah. They didn't like the Irish too well. <laughs> did they live in Cincinnati? Yeah, they did. I don't think they liked the Irish too well. They always said I had the mother in law from hell. All <laughs> <laughs> well, because I was Irish. But that's too bad. Were I love Cliff and he loved me and that's all that mattered. Yeah. Did they, um, were they born in America or did they come from? Yeah, they, they were born in America. So he was of German descent. I did. I did German descent. Well, I know your daughter. She's a wonderful teacher. I'm glad. Uh, Kathy was away from teaching for so long. You know, she, she was, when she first got out of school, she was teaching at St. Dominic's, and and then uh, she got out of it because if she made two hundred dollars less, she could get food stamps. <laughs> She had to figure it out, so she got into those offers and other jobs, and she was out of there doing other work besides teaching. And then uh, just recently she decided to go to the mountain and get, uh, get the, all the credits she had to do to, 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 to get it renewed. And I think she's ten times happier teaching. Kathy's very good at it. She spends hours at home working at the on the computer, everything is put in the computer. I was out there with her all over the holiday, Easter. Over what holiday? The last holiday it was Easter. Easter. I was out there from the Holy Thursday afternoon until well, she had the whole week off, and then the following Monday, and I was out there at her place. I stayed with Kathy when her, because hers is the most convenient house, and the convenient it's when she saw more. Like I'll go out again this summer sometime and spend a week with her. And I just sit in the chair and enjoy television. She waits on me. Well, that's not bad. But she's real, it's nice to go to her house. and I can smoke when I want to and nobody can get after me. Now, your sister and you are both nurses.